All right. Are we good to go? So how is everyone? No one's coughing or fever or anything like that. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we did the midterm last night. Yeah, some tireds online and some goods online. So that's good too. Um, I looked at the multiple choice part of the midterm so far, and things are looking very good. The class average on the writ on the multiple choice part is like around 80, which is super good. So that makes me really happy because um, now there's still the other 60% that I haven't looked at any of those yet, so I don't know what to expect. Um, but I'll tell you how I feel about this material at this point in the course. I, I like this placement of the midterm where it shows up in the course material because it kind of forces everyone to like get all that stuff into their heads, which makes the next chapter much easier. So chapter eight is the next sort of big chapter that we're doing. And chapter eight, I'd say is 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 it's got more reactions than any chapter we've seen before, but the reactions are more straightforward. And so if you can understand, you know, there's only two mechanisms, for example, in this chapter. So if you, you can understand the basic ideas of how to do mechanisms, it's going to be simpler in this chapter because there's going to be fewer complications. Most of these don't have like rearrangements or like this kind of thing going on. Um, so I'm happy to see that most people, at least from the indication I have so far, are doing well with the early material, able to determine the mechanisms and you know answer those questions that we had. Uh, so. Please keep it up. Don't let your guard down. We're getting close to the end. We only have a few more units to cover. Um, but I would say definitely if you are comfortable with the material at this point, it's like we've come over the peak. You know, you've, you've gotten over the activation energy for the course. It's downhill from here. And so we're in the fast step, right? So that's good because it's not to say there's nothing difficult or complex and uh, I really like this upcoming chapter, chapter eight, because it allows you to mix and match reactions from different chapters in combinations. And that's, I think, one of the most satisfying aspects of organic chemistry, which we have not been able to explore yet because we've only done reactions that do substitution or elimination. So when we start chaining them together, then it gets a little bit more interesting. But before we get into chapter eight, we do have a little bit left at the end of chapter seven that we didn't cover for the midterm. Remember chapter seven was about how to make alkenes, how to make pi bonds, how to make double bonds through elimination. And then we tacked on the stuff with alcohols as well. Uh, there's a kind of a bit of a unit at the end on alkynes where we discover how we can make triple bonds as well. It kind of goes thematically with this idea of making double bonds. Alkynes, remember, have a carbon-carbon triple bond and those triple bonds are made up of a sigma sigma bond formed by the overlap of two sp orbitals, as well as two p orbitals that overlap to give you two pi bonds. So just remember, and, and this becomes important later on, because sigma bonds are strong, pi bonds, relatively speaking, are weak. We can do chemistry on pi bonds. It's hard to do chemistry on sigma bonds, especially carbon-carbon sigma bonds, right? Just like uh, fluorine is a bad leaving group because carbon and fluorine makes a strong bond. Carbon and carbon make a strong bond, and so carbon-carbon bonds are difficult to break as well. That's why almost all the chemistry we're doing so far is sort of like functional group chemistry. We're doing chemistry of the side groups, knocking off a side group, replacing it for something else, or eliminating, or something along those lines. Get your welcome bonus on Volcano Vegas. <laughs> Let me close my email. Uh, OK, so we're going to deal with alkynes. We're going to look at how to make alkynes. And it is pretty straightforward if you remember the E2 mechanism that we did previous chapter. So if you have a molecule that's called a vicinal dihalide, vicinal 
the word vicinal in chemistry just means adjacent. So if two, so a, a dihalide is a compound with two halogens, and vicinal means that those two halogens are side by side. There are ones on a, we'll call it an alpha and a beta carbon. They're on net adjacent carbons. What's the word to describe if they're both on the same carbon? If two things and they're both on the exact same carbon. We had a name for this earlier on. You know the word, but you're probably not thinking of it right now. The word is geminal. Geminal means both are attached to the same carbon. Vicinal means they're both attached to adjacent carbons. So if you have a vicinal dihalide, like this compound right here, that's an alkene with a bromine on carbon two and a bromine on carbon three, what you can do is uh, an elimination reaction where you basically do two eliminations. You do a first elimination of an HBr, just like an E2 that you would have done previous work to make an alkene, uh, and then you can do a second one to make the alkyne. Now, in order to do this, you can't use an ordinary garden variety base like an alkoxide. Alkoxides are kind of strong bases, but they're not super strong. They're about as strong as sodium hydroxide, which is pretty strong, but we want something stronger. We need something stronger if you want to make an alkyne. So the base of choice that we use is NaNH2. So of course, when you have sodium, you dissociate them apart and you have Na plus, you have NH2, two lone pairs and a negative charge. This is our base. And it's a stronger base than hydroxide for all those reasons that we would have looked at back in unit three. Okay, It's less electronegative than oxygen, but in the same row. So nitrogen is not as good at holding a negative charge as oxygen. That makes this less stable and therefore a stronger base. So we're going to introduce this new base into your lexicon. And when you see that base, think very, very strong base. It can do some reactions that sodium hydroxide is not strong enough to do. OK, so here's an example. We have uh, a molecule with a vicinal dihalide. And what we're going to do to this vicinal dihalide is we're going to have to add three equivalents uh, of the sodium amide base, not just two even though we're only removing two equivalents of HBr or HCl. And I'll explain why that is in a minute. There's a second step with HA, just adding some kind of acid. Could be water, in fact. And that makes your alkyne product that you see here. So you can make alkynes from all sorts of things. You can make them starting from an alkene by brominating, which is a reaction we do in Chapter 8, and then doing this double elimination. So if you can make this vicinal dihalide, Double elimination will, will go. This one is gem. Gem works too. You just need dichloride. So here's the mechanism. And here's why you need three equivalents of base. And when I say equivalent, what that means is if you have one mole of starting material, you need three moles of base. If you have half a mole of starting material, you need one and a half moles of base. You need three times, three units for every unit of, of starting material. So you have your vicinal dihalide here, a molecule of NH2 minus, acts as a base, does an elimination, and makes your alkene that you see here. There's still a bromine left. This is a small base. It'll form, it'll follow Zaitsev's rule. And then what happens is you can take a second mole of base and do a second elimination. This is a lot harder to do, but you can do it. And when that happens, you get your alkyne. Now, in this example, we're only using two equivalents of base. Sometimes you have to use three. And I'll tell you the difference. This alkyne, that's a product here, I would call an internal alkyne. And what that means is that attached to the two sp carbons,
you have a CH3 and you have a CH3. We would say that this alkyne is in the middle of this chain. It's not at the end. So if the alkyne you're making is in the middle of a chain, like it is here, then, um, then you only need two equivalents of base for the reason you see here. Eliminate once, eliminate twice, you have your product. But if you have a terminal alkyne, you need a third one. And the reason is, and it's on this slide, but I'd rather draw it out. If you have an alkyne like this, that SPCH is acidic. It's not really acidic, but it's acidic enough that it can react with a really strong base like the one we needed to do the elimination. So what this can do is make this thing, which we would call an acetylide. Or maybe more generally, alkanide. Ide mead means anion, and it's made from an alkyne, so it's an alkanide. So you need three equivalents because if you start with something like this, You're going to use the first equivalent to do the first elimination. Make something like this. Okay, and then you're going to use the second equivalent. Actually, I'm not going to draw it like that. to make the second elimination. And then the third equivalent to deprotonate that, so it's use three. Well, the question I always get is, well, why don't you just add two so the last step doesn't happen? And, and the answer is, is you, you don't do it one molecule at a time, you have, you know, a mole, you have 10 to the 26 mo uh, molecules all together in solution. If you have, let's say you have one mole of this and you only added two moles of base, what it's going to do is take two thirds of your starting molecules all the way to the end and one third doesn't do anything. What you have to do is add that extra uh, equivalent to make sure that you have enough base to convert all molecules all the way to the end of this process. And then once you have this, you can re react it with some sort of acid, like water is strong enough acid, um, or you may want to use dilute HCl or, or something like that, just something to, to give protons here. And that'll put the hydrogen back on the end. Okay. All right, that's only a thing because for alkynes, because alkynes are the only ones that are strong enough acids. Uh, NaNH2 is a strong enough base to pull off those CHs, but it's not strong enough to pull them off alkenes or alkanes. These have pKa's that are much too high, but it will work great if you have an alkyne starting compound to pull those off. Um, the, those acetylides, by the way, these things here, are actually great nucleophiles. They're also great bases. So getting back into our material from chapter six and chapter seven, where we talk about things that are good bases and good nucleophiles, they're kind of like alkoxides. In fact, the chemistry of this thing is an awful lot like a small alkoxide. So that means if you reacted, right, if you took something like Br, Br, NaNH2, three equivalents, that's going to make this, and then treated that with 
a primary alkyl halide, it's going to do SN2. Like this. So we can do SN2s with this if you have a primary or a methyl halide. If you have a secondary or tertiary, you can't do SN2s, especially with the tertiary, you can't use SN2. For a secondary, it'll do elimination E2 like an alkoxide will. Um, so you, you could use this as a base to do elimination E2 if you want, but it's kind of exotic, uh, expensive. It'd be a pain to use this. Like alkoxides are cheap and easy to make. So the next reaction you have to realize is if you take a terminal alkyne, only terminal ones, react it with a strong, strong base. Sodium hydroxide is not strong enough. You can make that. So you form that alkanide, and then you, you can put in a primary or a methyl alkyl halide. And you can add that CH3 on the end. So you can make carbon-carbon bonds. I think this might be our first reaction where we're making carbon-carbon bonds. Well, no, I technically addition of cyanide by SN2 is making a carbon-carbon bond as well. But this is a way to make a carbon chain longer if you wanted to make carbon chains longer. Why would you want to make a carbon chain longer? Well, gasoline has carbon chains that are like on average eight carbons long. And natural gas has carbons that are one carbon long. So if you could take natural gas, if that happened to be abundant and turn it into gasoline, you could get maybe more value out of that product. In fact, that's done all the time. Uh, in fact, what's more normal is take longer chains and break them into smaller ones. It's called cracking. Actually, to make them longer, you can make them super long, and that's polymerization. That's how you make polyethylene. I think we talked about that in unit nine. So yeah, that's something you need to know about alkynes. If they're terminal alkynes, you can deprotonate the end with a very strong base. That makes them nucleophiles with equivalent chemistry or very similar chemistry to an alkoxide. So whatever alkoxides would do in that situation, these will do the same thing in that situation. SN2 with primary and methyl. E2 with anything bigger than that. As you see in this example, that's a secondary one. Great. That's it. So that's chapter seven in a nutshell. And now we get to go into chapter eight. Great. So chapter eight is going to be looking at the previous chapter and flipping it. Last chapter was all about how to eliminate, do a beta elimination, lose a leaving group and a beta hydrogen to make alkenes was the focus. Um, we're going to do the other way around. We're going to take an alkene and we're going to add something to the alkene to make it saturated. So we're kind of doing the elimination process in reverse. And the reverse of elimination is called addition. So once again, in chemistry, we like to give things very straightforward names that describe the process that you're doing. Like dehydrohalogenation is a great name for a reaction. It sounds complicated, but D, you're removing something, hydro, hydrogen, halogenation. So you're removing a hydrogen and a halogen, and that's like the name is basically just saying that, that same thing. Dehydration, we're removing water. So we're going to be looking at addition reactions. One thing about organic chemistry, like when you get into organic too, um, a lot of reactions don't have those nice names. They give them names that are named after people, like the Suzuki coupling, or the Robinson annulation, or the Simmons-Smith reaction. I find those hard, harder to remember than if you just give it a name that's describing what's happening chemically in that process. Okay, so here, this is the reaction that we're going to do. We're going to take an alkene. We're going to take some group AB, generally speaking. We're going to add A to one side, B to the other. This is an addition reaction. It converts the carbons from SP2 to SP3. And we have lots of examples of these. 
First one, hydrogenation. This is a very important industrial reaction. Um, if you read the ingredients of most processed foods, it'll say hydrogenated vegetable oil. It's vegetable oil that's been treated by this reaction, hydrogenation. What you do is you take hydrogen gas, H2, and you take your molecule, your alkene starting compound, and you put some sort of metal catalyst in there. And the metals that we normally use are either platinum, palladium, rhodium, or nickel. Platinum and palladium work best. Nickel is the cheapest. So there's different reasons why you might want to use those. Um, so what you do is you take basically any solvent. Uh, you mix your starting material in there, put in some platinum, which is like fine metal powder, and then you put it into like a pressure container. We, we call these bombs in chemistry, like a bomb calorimeter. We don't mean like we want it to blow up. In fact, it just means it's high pressure inside. And you can put in high pressure of hydrogen. And what it'll do is it'll convert your double bond to a single bond by adding in a hydrogen to both sides. So it saturates the double bond alkenes to alkanes. So the reason why this is done a lot in um, in food science is because if you have a fat like oleic acid, like vegetable oil, where you have lots of double bonds in these chains, um, they have pi bonds. Pi bonds are reactive, right? They're a functional group. You don't want functional functionality in your chain if you want your food to last a long time because reactions make the food spoil. And the reaction for fats is called, it's, it's going rancid. Fats will go rancid, they'll oxidize um, because of a reaction that is enabled. I think we'll look at the reaction a little bit before the end of the course that happens with fat spoiling. It's lipid, no, it's not lipid peroxidation. Uh, it's a radical reaction though. Uh, anyway, we have the double bond there. So if you want your food to last longer, you expose it to hydrogenation to make this saturated chain. And those, that saturated chain, therefore, is much less reactive, much longer shelf life, and your food will last longer on the shelf. So there's one reason why you do it. Second, it changes the properties. If you have kinked chains like that, they're typically oils, or these ones are solids. So... Early margarine was made by just taking vegetable oil and partially hydrogenating it. So you hydrogenate it enough so it's not like a hard brick, but that it's sort of soft, it's spreadable, and they would just only partly hydrogenate it a certain amount of time. Problem with that process, partial hydrogenation, is that you get trans fats as well, that initially people didn't really know about, but we know about that now. So they don't, partial hydrogenation is not a great process anymore. So you can see this is just the, the a food package where you see partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil. Um, so yeah, partial hydrogenation can produce trans fats. Newer techniques can reduce this. So uh, uh, one way to do this is rather than take all your fat and then hydrogenate it 70% to completion, you could take 70% of your fat push it 100% and then mix it with 30% that hasn't been treated at all, you get your 70% uh, saturated fat without exposing your whole thing to the hydrogenation conditions. So there's, there's, there's methods around that. So how does hydrogenation work? Well, you need a metal catalyst. And the thing about the metal catalyst, which is unusual, we've seen catalysis already in the course. Remember, dehydration was acid catalyzed. An acid acted in step one, was regenerated in the last step, acting as a catalyst in that reaction. Um, that's what we would call a homogeneous catalyst. Homogeneous means everything's in the same phase. So all your things are dissolved in your solvent. The acid catalyst was also dissolved in the solvent. Hydrogenation uses what's called um, a heterogeneous catalyst, meaning the catalyst is in a different phase than the rest of the reaction. So we use a metal, we use a metal powder, and that's a solid. And that goes into the solution here and it stays as a solid. It's not dissolving. 
right? Which makes it easy to remove because you can just filter it off when you're done. Um, but it's like a reaction at the surface of a solid between a solid and the gas. So what happens is if you take hydrogen and you take one of those metals, it's finely ground up into a powder, treated under high pressure, hydrogen, you know, if you look at the surface of your metal, hydrogen will come along and kind of break the HH bond and have hydrogens studding the surface of the metal. And that's what happens first. Then you put your alkene in, and the alkene is flat, remember. Those two carbons are sp2, they're trigonal planar. Think of it like a flat sheet, and it can kind of hover down, land on the surface. Think of it like a UFO, and the surface of this catalyst is like a cornfield. And it's like lowering down onto the surface, more or less flat object. And what happens when it reaches the surface is one of those hydrogens can kind of just come up and attach to the bottom side of the carbon. Can't attach on the top because it's it's you know it's resting. Just like if you were on the ground and a UFO started to land, you couldn't just like jump onto the top. You could maybe jump and touch the bottom of it if it was low enough. So when this comes down, a hydrogen will jump attached to one carbon, and a second hydrogen will jump and attach to the other carbon. And then once that's happened, the alkene floats away, or so the alkane product floats away, and then more hydrogen can go back on the surface and another alkene can come down. Now, the reason why it's important that this happens at the surface, and this is flat when it comes down, is because both hydrogens have to add to the same face of the alkene. They add together, I mean sequentially, but the alkene comes down, hydrogen one comes on, hydrogen two comes on, it detaches and floats away. So you can't have one hydrogen go on the bottom and then another hydrogen come from the top because they come from the bottom, both from the surface of the metal and they come together. This kind of addition of two things at once, or at least sequentially or at once, but both on the exact same surface is what we call a syn addition. So think of this flat molecule like we have here, okay? Top and bottom. There's no difference between the top and the bottom because it's a flat molecule. So in syn addition, both have to add to the exact same side. So that would look like this. We're gonna use rhodium in this case as our metal catalyst. Both hydrogens end up on the same face of the alkene. That means the two methyls that we have here are cis. So written out sort of the normal way, this with hydrogen and palladium, platinum, rhodium, or nickel. will give you the cis product only. You won't get any of the trans because of that way it adds. Cool. So here's some examples. You have an alkene here, and you get this. Notice that it doesn't work on esters. There's, there's double bonds there, but this reaction is for carbon-carbon double bonds, not carbon-oxygen. Okay. Um, this is another example, uh, kind of a weird example, but in this case, there's not really a difference between cis and trans because you're making a CH2. You can't tell from the product there whether you added it syn or anti. But one thing that we did do was create a chiral center. Because there's no difference, you know, they both come on the same side, but they could come both from the bottom or both from the top. Depends how the alkene happens to land on the surface. So for that reason, if you're making a chiral center like you are in this case, it's going to be racemic. 50% R, 50% S, because there's no preference for it to land one way versus the other. It's flat, both sides are the same, and that's it. Now, this is a weird example. This is alpha pinene. <clears throat> this is a 
This molecule is the number one pollutant, VOC, volatile organic compound pollutant, in the Fraser Valley in Vancouver. A friend of mine did her master's looking at VOCs, volatile organic compounds in air, in Toronto versus Vancouver. Uh, the main one, I'll get to your question. I see your question there, Sam. Um, the main VOC in Toronto was unburned gasoline. So if there's gas spills or if you have an engine that doesn't completely combust it, comes out the tailpipe, um, that was the major organic pollutant. But it was this molecule in Vancouver, which is alpha pinene, which is produced by pine trees. So it's the molecule responsible for fresh Christmas tree smell. If you cut a Christmas tree down and that pine smell is pinene, the name comes from. Uh, Sam's saying when you ask, when you say phase, is that solid, liquid, or gas being the phase? Yes, that's exactly it. So the whole reaction is in the liquid phase, except for the catalyst, which is in the solid phase. This molecule is just a kind of a neat example of an alkene where the top and the bottom phase are not equivalent. Most alkenes, they are, right? If you have an alkene like this, the one we saw before, top and bottom are identical. But for this one, excuse me, the top one's kind of crowded. And, and so the major product in this case, oh, that's perfect, isn't it? Uh, the major product will have the hydrogens add from the bottom because it's the less crowded phase. In these rare examples where you have the, a difference between the top and the bottom phase, it'll add to the bottom, it'll add to the less crowded phase because that's going to be the one it can rest on the surface with. Although I don't think we give you questions like that. You can do hydrogenation as well of alkynes. And it turns out like if you take an alkyne and you, tr you treat it with hydrogen under the same conditions, platinum or palladium, you can add hydrogen to this double bond of an alkyne as well. That makes a cis alkene, but the cis alkene is produced, stuck to the surface with the hydrogen still there. You can't actually stop it at the alkene phase. If it reacts at all, it's going to react twice and go straight to an alkane. So you can turn al alkynes into alkanes. Okay, so already we, we have the beginnings of some reactions that we can string together. For example, let's say you have this and you want to make it into this. Can you do that? Yes. Strong base makes the anion. Br makes this. H2 and platinum makes this. This is how organic chemists think. How can we sequence together the reactions that we know to take something that looks unrelated to the product, but convert it that way, right? I think I keep talking about the example of vitamin B12, first complex natural product to be made with a sequence of steps like this, 60 steps. And not all 60 steps were known when he started. So we had to invent some steps along the way, invent new chemistry. It's a whole field of organic chemistry called natural uh, product synthesis where people find these big complex natural products and then try to make them. And it's really energy and time consuming and you get almost never get a useful amount of it at the end. But people like doing it to test sort of the uh, um, strategies for doing reactions. And sometimes it forces you to have to develop new kinds of reactions to transformations that our existing understanding of reactions can't do. So we're slowly going to get there. I'll turn you all into natural products chemists by the end here. Great. So you can't stop it at the cis if you just use hydrogen and platinum. It goes all the way to the alkane. So it goes alkyne to alkane. But you can use a different catalyst. We've developed catalysts that we call poisoned catalysts. These are catalysts that have been treated in a certain way to make them less active. And the common one that we use is called Lindlar palladium. 
So we're going to take palladium metal and we're going to poison it by treating it with a mixture of lead acetate, quinoline, and palladium. Well, palladium is what you're adding. So if you mix lead acetate and quinoline, what it'll do is it'll form uh, kind of like a, a coating, if you will, on the surface of the, of the catalyst, which makes it kind of not as active as before. Poison catalysts are generally a bad thing because you want your catalyst to be active and be able to produce as much product as possible. But in this case, if you poison it um, purposefully, and there's another compound that'll do it called nickel boride, Ni2B, uh, what happens is you can just do one addition of hydrogen and this catalyst is not strong enough to add a second equivalent to the alkene. So what this does is if you have an alkyne and you treat it with hydrogen with a poisoned catalyst, it'll do syn addition and give you a cis alkene like that. So you always get cis. It's always syn addition because we know why, because the hydrogens always have to attack from the same angle, same direction. So we're already kind of building up a couple of reactions. We have hydrogenation of alkenes using platinum, palladium, rhodium, nickel. Hydrogenation of alkynes, which goes to an alkane as well. And now we have poisoned catalyst hydrogenation of alkynes, which stops at the cis alkene. And we keep piling them on, there's lots of them. What if you wanted a trans alkene and not the cis? Well, we got a way to do that too. Almost every transformation you can imagine, we've developed a way to do it. And when I say we, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, <clears throat> there's a reaction which is called the dissolving metal reduction. And it's called the dissolving metal reduction because it starts out, you add solid metal. And, and as the reaction proceeds, the metal dissolves away. You can tell the reaction's done when the metal is gone. Dissolving metal reduction takes a group one metal like sodium or lithium, and this is just metallic sodium. And I don't know if you've ever used metallic sodium before. It's uh, soft. You can cut it with a butter knife, okay, which is unusual for a metal. It's kind of waxy kind of feeling. And you use ammonia or some other amine as a solvent. And what happens is you take your alkyne, put it into this condition, and it makes a trans addition. It's a neat reaction because what happens is the sodium um, in the presence of ammonia becomes Na plus plus electron. That's an electron. Well, you know what an electron is, but normally you think of electrons as being inadequate. You can have electrons solvated, dissolved electrons is a weird thing. We can see electrons like this. We, can, we know what color they are, they're blue. So you can make a solution of electrons. And the electrons react with this and end up making a trans alkene. We have a mechanism for it that we don't make you learn. Um, cover until chapter 10, I don't know if we're gonna cover it at all. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a neat reaction that turns bright, bright blue when you start. When the reaction's complete, it goes back colorless again. So we know how to turn an alkyne into either an alkane, a cis alkene, or a trans alkene. And you, you can pick which one you want by choosing carefully your conditions. Okay, you either hydrogenate with an active metal like platinum, palladium, nickel, rhodium. You hydrogenate with a poison catalyst like Lindlar palladium, or dissolving metal reduction using sodium metal in ammonia. Now these conditions, Na, NH3, is really easy to mix up with Na, NH2. These are different, right? If you have this, these conditions here, let me give you that. These conditions here, Give you that. One is a strong base, NaNH2. The other is sodium metal in ammonia, solvent. 
the sodium will reduce it. That. Wonderful. So this chapter has two mechanisms that we can ask you to draw. In fact, they're both the same mechanism, but I would say there's there's two variations of this mechanism. And the me mechanism is called electrophilic addition. And remember how we have names for like nucleophilic substitution. We have SN1, SN2. For elimination, we have E1, E2. The, the code, I guess, for electrophilic addition is ADE2. Okay. Or AD is addition, and in fact, it should be like that. AD is addition. The E is electrophilic, just like for SN2, the lowercase n was nucleophilic. This is electrophilic. And 2 means the rate determining step is bimolecular. And we're going to look at a number of reactions. Forget about these sections. That's from an old book. We're going to be doing addition of HX. We're going to be doing not this one, addition of water and addition of X2. Okay. So we're going to be doing three of these reactions as we go through. So here's the first one. If you take a strong acid, HCl, HBr, HI, and treat an alkene with that, it will do an addition that'll put a hydrogen on one side and a bromine on the other. Another example, cyclohexene plus HCl adds hydrogen to one side, chlorine to the other. This is the reverse of dehydrohalogenation. If you saw this reaction in reverse, you'd say, yeah, that's elimination, that's dehydrohalogenation, removing a hydrogen and uh, a halogen. This is the opposite. It's adding that to those same carbons. Mechanism. This is a mechanism you need to know, and the mechanism is very straightforward. And I said this when we were back in the previous chapter. You have a reaction where one of your reactants is a strong acid. Your first step is going to be a proton transfer. You're going to acid base. You're going to add that proton to something that can accept it. And you may not think that an alkene is a good proton acceptor acting as a base, but it can. You can use an alkene as a base, like you see here. And there's an acid base reaction. You can see according to those arrows, pair of electrons in the pi bond of that CC bond tax the hydrogen. Only pi bonds can do this because only pi bonds are weak enough to react like this. Sigma bonds are too strong. The hydrogen pops on first. It gives you, in this example, a secondary carbocation. And we have bromide. What's going to happen if you have bromide and a carbocation sitting beside each other? What's bromide going to do? Yeah, it's going to jump on. It's going to attack. Okay. That's a nucleophilic attack, isn't it? Same as what you'd have for SN1, nucleophilic attack. Why do we call this electrophilic addition then? If this is a nucleophilic attack. The reason is because bromine attacking the carbocation is not the rate determining step. The rate determining step is the one that's drawn here, formation of the carbocation. The rate determining step, if there's a carbocation being formed, Forming it is going to be the rate limiting step, rate determining step. That is electrophilic because your substrate, your alkene, is reacting with an acid and it's an electrophile. Okay, so the first step is an electrophilic reaction. Acid base reaction, yes, but it's electrophilic. Okay, proton adds first. Uh, Bromide, add second, and you get your product. Okay. Pretty straightforward mechanism. It's a lot like SN1 of alcohols, except SN1 had an extra step. SN1, you had to protonate the alcohol, then the alcohol left to make the cation, then you could have nucleophile attack. This one's a little simpler. 
a little more straightforward. Now, most alkenes, when you add HX, you could add it potentially two ways around. You could add either the right carbon gets the halogen or the left carbon gets the halogen. So, for example, if you look at this one here, you could put either the chlorine on the left or you could put chlorine on the right. And this one, chlorine on the left, chlorine on the right, chlorine on the left, chlorine on the right. Almost always, you can imagine at least two possible ways around of adding the halogen. It turns out that in all of these three examples, the chlorine ends up on the left-hand carbon. And it's not left, it doesn't like prefer the left or anything like that. It always will attach to the carbon that is more substituted. Okay, so notice, you know, this side is di-substituted, this side is unsubstituted. The halogen will end up on the more substituted side. Always. Okay, and that makes complete sense if you think about the mechanism. We're making a carbocation, that positive charge has to end up on the same side that the halogen attacks. And if you can put the positive charge left or right, you will want to put the positive charge on the carbon that's more substituted. All right? Look at this example. If you have You could put the hydrogen on the right side, right? We already have hydrogens here. Positive there versus positive there. This is tertiary versus primary. This is the one that's going to form. It's not going to form the other one. So then the bromide. We'll attack that one. So it'll always add to the more substitute side when it has a choice of adding to one versus the other. I mean, in some cases, there's no difference, right? If you have cyclohexene, both sides are the same. There's no difference which way you'd attack. Cool. Great. So that rule is called Markovnikov's rule. Another Russian organic chemist. So Markovnikov's rule just says that if you're doing electrophilic addition of HX or any electrophilic addition to a double bond, the halogen will add, the hydrogen will add to the less substituted side, and then the other part you're adding, which in this case is a halogen, will go to the more substituted side. Maybe another way to think about it is if you have a carbocation mechanism, it's going to go through the carbocation that is more stable. So if it's got two possible pathways, it'll pick the more stable pathway to go. It'll be faster and you'll have, that'll be your major product. Cool. Now this is a carbocation and we know carbocations have this pesky habit of rearrangements. Uh, so this can happen as well for electrophilic addition on certain molecules. So for example, if you look at this alkene, the BR ends up up on this carbon, which means there's a carbocation that must have rearranged. So what's happened here is proton transfer happened to make a secondary carbocation. That rearranged, and then the product comes from the rearranged carbocation. This is not new. You know, you should already be looking out for rearrangements in secondary carbocations based on the previous chapter. The chemistry here is identical. Okay, it's the same carbocation, it's the same rearrangement. You look for them the same way, you write them the same way, everything is the same, except we're starting with an alkene as opposed to starting with an alcohol or starting with an alcohol halide. Doesn't matter. So that's one nice thing about organic chemistry, it's consistent happens in one case it'll happen in the next case too meaning we can take what we learned in one case and apply it to a different case great um i'm going to stop here it's 9 20. we've kind of already learned quite a bit though in this chapter we learned three different hydrogenation reactions and we learned the first of your two mechanisms 
which is electrophilic addition of HX. Perfect. Um, this lecture is recorded. I'll put this online um, and everyone have a great day. I'll try to get the grading done as soon as I can. I have marks up for you. Uh, I expect soon I can release the at least the multiple choice part, but the other part will take me some time to get through. All right. Have a good day.